Well, great. We've, uh, as we've cycled through the intro slides, we uh, are set to get started. I want to thank everyone. It's almost 100 people uh, already joining and more joining by the minute. We have an outstanding faculty, and I want to thank um, uh, everyone for participating tonight. I uh, see Marissa Mucho in the audience. So hi, Marissa. And uh, I'd like to encourage everyone in the audience to please use your chat feature. Please use your QA feature. It's great to be able to do this from our, uh, our homes, but um, uh, if we miss the opportunity to really connect and engage. So uh, please try to help us keep it a little bit uh, real. Um, so I want to thank uh, Prachi and Amber, uh, the co-chairs of this uh, CME activity tonight for an incredible amount of organizational work. Uh, this is something we do a couple times a year. Uh, usually we uh, host one that's uh, focused more on just scoliosis. Uh, and this one is focused on conservative non-operative spine care, including uh, care of the developed athlete. You'll hear from Ian Leahy, uh, care, primary spine care for the primary care provider. You'll hear from uh, Amika, one of the nurse practitioners in our office. You'll hear from Ben Roy, my partner, about when it's not just back pain, from Amber about resources for spine deformity, from Prachi about physical therapy. Um, and, um, and then David Skaggs, our uh, guest uh, visitor, will speak a little bit about the back pain for algorithm. So we have a great uh, couple hours for you. Um, and with that, I will uh, get things started with my uh, talk entitled Cure AIS. So I will uh, share my screen. <clears throat> okay, here we go. So provocatively titled Cure AIS, the question really is why are we not doing better in this space? Why do so many kids still have scoliosis that progresses? And even if we admit that um, it, it will not be a never event, are we, um, taking the best care for kids with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. My main disclosure as it uh, pertains to this is that we have a very active center for the conservative treatment of scoliosis, and we offer Schrock physical therapy and Rigo Chanel bracing. Um, so the bottom line here is that there's a significant opportunity to improve the non-operative care of patients with AIS, and there's a lot of variability in this space. Variability is bad. Variability happens because there's a lack of evidence about the best options, because of cultural biases. And the reality is that unexplained variability, as you see here, means some patients are not getting the best care. There was a great randomized uh, trial which showed that um, bracing works and that there were significant higher rates of bracing success when uh, patients were um, in the brace at least 15 to 18 hours a day. That was a randomized trial that everyone on the uh, Zoom is aware of. And I think um, it's um, pretty clear that um, bracing works and no one should be not offering bracing for the right patients these days. But if you look at it, um, and these are all surveys that we've done, sorry, these are all surveys that we've done um, you see that there's a lot of variability about the number of hours that this group of 23 Northeast uh, US spine surgeons recommend a brace. And there's a lot of variability about measuring compliance. Um, more than uh, about half of uh, uh, providers don't measure compliance at all. Um, there are now new devices. This was an older device that we used at our place. Now we're using a, a temperature button. Uh, but there are all sorts of devices to measure compliance and fit that are coming out that allow constant feedback to the kid and the family. And this is really critically important to optimize use. We all do better when we know we're being watched. Braced also taught us this. It also taught us that um, not only does it matter how much you wear it, but it matters the amount of correction. And for any combination of cob angle and maturity, more correction meant more success at avoiding progression. Unfortunately, um, this also is not something that's commonplace. And probably once a week, I'll get an, a kid who comes in who has a brace performed at an outside institution who's never had an x-ray in the brace. And when we go ahead and get that x-ray in the brace, as you see in this example, now there's really no difference in correction in and outside the brace. So we're asking the kid to wear the brace. And even if they're compliant, how could this really be any better than placebo if we're getting no correction at all in the brace? 
if you ask um, people in a survey if they routinely get x-rays, you see that about 80% do, but 20% don't. If you look at the issue of types of braces, there are many, many, many types of braces. And a lot of this re represents regional bias and who you trained with as the surgical treatment generally. But at least in my view, and in the view of our center, uh, there's enough evidence here to sort of weigh one way or the other. Uh, there's been a number of studies. This is a great finite element analysis showing uh, the comparative efficacy of different types of braces and this study really shows that, um, that asymmetrical designs that allow maintenance of sagittal plane do better. And in fact, that's what the Rio Chanel brace is all about. It's an asymmetrical brace with large cutouts that allows large amounts of 3D correction in the sagittal plane, the axial plane, as well as the frontal plane, which probably has been overemphasized of late. Um, this, there's also clinical evidence uh, Paul Sponseller's group showed lower rates of progression uh, and better uh, curve correction in a Rigo as compared to a Boston. But if you look at surgeons at, uh, through IPOT, you see that there's a lot of variability with only about a third using a Rigo style brace um, and uh, lots of different types of braces out there. What about when to wean? And um, I think there's a lot of variability in this area as well. Lori Carroll and TSRH showed that we are probably weaning too early much of the time, especially in larger curves. And weaning at RISR-4 probably is going to result in more people progressing and more people getting surgery. Of course, um, if you're using RISR, you're probably not making the best decisions either. And this is a study done at both CHOP and at our place. Uh, ben Roy was the first author, which showed that if you're using the iliac apotheosial closure, the RISR score, you have mismatch and probably suboptimal decision-making about 25% of the time. And in my view, you should only really be using digital hand x-rays or proximal humerus or ulna x-rays to really make decisions about weaning initiation and cessation of bracing. Again, uh, lots of uh, variability here, um, meaning um, uh, some of these patients are not getting the right care. What about Schwartz physical therapy? I love this uh, picture from uh, the predecessor of our hospital a long, long time ago of uh, kids getting physical therapy for scoliosis. And when I present this at medical meetings with surgeons, I often get people say, how could this possibly work? Well, I think the reality is just like any other joint that we're treating, if I have a um, difficulty or contracture of my knee, we stretch the concave tissues, we strengthen the convex, muscles, and in the growing child, we relieve the asymmetrical end plate stresses that uh, result in this cycle of Hoyter volkman of asymmetrical growth, increased loading, increased deformity. Uh, and that's the rationale for bracing. Um, I think that secondarily, um, that's sorry, that's the rationale for um, uh, Schwab physical therapy. I think that secondarily, kids that participate in SHROP are more compliant in bracing, uh, are probably recover after surgery faster and are more satisfied with a post-op result. It's a form of empowerment. And there's a number of uh, articles that have showed in now four or five randomized trials, the last of which is a double blind uh, randomized trial that um, SHROP physical therapy results in uh, decreased curve progression. Uh, the last study that I uh, referenced there, Monte Cohen, showed that at only one year follow-up, there was about an eight degree difference in patients in the uh, experimental Schroth group and the physical therapy, the regular physical therapy group. Of course, compliance is an issue for Schroth as well. And our group has showed, this is a study that uh, Prachi and Kelly have uh, done, that even in a very uh, engaged uh, group of patients in New York City, only about 25% of patients continue doing SHROP one year later. And this is a major challenge. It's something we need to work on and improve over time. Um, what we did show though, is that in the group that was compliant, the blue line here, there was a small decrease in the curve as compared to about a four or five degree increase in the curve in the group that was not compliant. So just like bracing, just like taking your blood pressure medicine, compliance matters. Um, 
if you look at when people um, prescribe scoliosis specific physical therapy, not surprisingly, the answer is all over the board here. Uh, and again, we need to have a better understanding of the optimal uh, indications for Schrock physical therapy to better guide patient care. Finally, what about vitamin D and AIS? Um, I prescribe vitamin D to all of my AIS patients because there's some evidence that uh, many, many children have low vitamin D and even more patients with AIS have low vitamin D. Um, furthermore, there's at least one, probably two well done studies now that show that in a randomized trials, patients who had high dose vitamin D, which is actually only about two glasses of vitamin D worth a day, had lower rates of progression. While we're all waiting for these studies to be replicated, the truth is the risk of this amount of vitamin D in a healthy person is essentially zero. And I think the risk benefit weighs in starting your patients on 800 units of vitamin D. And again, lots of variation here, uh, reflecting that we, we still have a lot of work to do. In summary, this tremendous variability in the approach to conservative scoliosis care in AIS, it implies that some patients are not getting the optimum care. There's a tremendous opportunity to research, but also a tremendous opportunity to standardize and optimum, optimize care. And you'll hear a little bit about some of that work that's uh, been done along the way by others who've actually published the best practice guideline in this area. Thank you very much. Appreciate everyone's uh, uh, attendance and, uh, uh, and participation tonight. And I'll ask you just to uh, hold questions until we move into uh, the next talk in the session, which is about physical therapy for the child with scoliosis uh, given by uh, Prachi Bakaramia. Thanks, Prachi. Thanks, Dr. Vitelli. Hi everybody, my name is Prachi Bakarania. I'm one of the physical therapists here at not the non-operative care for spine and scoliosis here at Columbia. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about best practices of physical therapy for the child with scoliosis. During my talk, I wanna to touch a little bit about trough and it's in italicized because it's become a bit of a buzzword, but really what we mean is scoliosis specific physical therapy. I also wanna start talking a little bit about how often and how long should my child come for physical therapy, how the medical community is slowly switching from wait to NC to try NC, which is incredible. And then will PSSE embracing reduce scoliosis curve? This is a question I get all the time. So PSSE, which is written in parentheses at the top is the formal word that you'll find in research studies. Um, scoliosis in general is rarely covered in schools, in, um, in PT schools in the US, but that's slowly changing. There are several PTs um, developing best practice guidelines through the APTA, even some scoliosis questions are showing up on licensure exams, so it's slowly turning around. And Schroth has become synonymous with scoliosis specific PT, but there are many schools of thought and many um, therapists that are certified are certified in various forms. Um, I listed the four main ones that are currently being practiced here in the U.S. Um, the primary one is BSPTS through the Barcelona Scoliosis Physical Therapy School. It's been recently rebranded and founded by Dr. Manuel Rigo. It involves multiple levels of certification. Um, the next being the Schroth Best Practice Academy. And this is actually um, Katerina Schroth's grandson, Dr. Weiss, who runs it. Um, SAES from Isico from Milan, Italy. This actually has um, the most largest breadth of uh, research studies available looking at scoliosis specific exercise. And finally, the Lyon method led by Dr. Jean-Claude de Moroy comes from France. And now it's available in an interactive online platform. So I'm sure many therapists will also be um, studying this as well. I think it's important when you are referring um, uh, to a scoliosis specific physical therapist. It's good to know where they were certified, how long they've been practicing. So when you're doing scoliosis PT, you really want to think about what type of scoliosis is it neuromuscular, is it juvenile, is it adolescent? Are we preparing them for surgery? Are we helping them post-op? Um, but essentially every curve pattern comes with, you know, exercises that likely fit best. And, um, and tailoring it to the child is often really beneficial. 
About six years ago, when we started doing these CMEs, this slide was much sadder. There weren't as many studies. And now we sort of know PSSE is beneficial. And now we're sort of getting into the nitty gritty of things. What's the dosage? Um, hopefully how to improve compliance. What are the best exercises? And now we've had, as Dr. Batali mentioned, a lot more studies available. Um, switching gears, talking about juvenile and adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, and really it's just when the child is diagnosed. If the child is juvenile, it's likely going to be more aggressive since there is a lot of growth remaining. And whenever you're thinking of um, having a very successful plan, it's very important to measure growth throughout their care. So here at Columbia, we use Sanders score to assess growth. It's a score from zero to eight. Zero to one being the child is very young, immature. If they're a girl, likely premenarchal. And I'm thinking of playing the long game, meaning my dosage is different. I don't want to see them twice a week for 12 weeks and then say goodbye, because as you know, compliance is terrible. When they become a Sanders three, they're likely gonna be burnt out from bracing, burnt out from exercise, and likely we are gonna fail. And that is sort of what happened previously. Here, Sanders zero to one, I'm saying, maybe I'm gonna see you once a month, because I know when you become a Sanders three or four, when you're gonna be at your peak stage of growth, I wanna ramp up PT, I wanna ensure compliance, I wanna make sure everything is going well. On the flip side, when they become a Sanders seven and eight, it's very important to have a discharge plan so that when they become adults, they are very successful, they're very confident in themselves. Um, the University of Iowa has been doing amazing work um, developing models to predict curve progression. It's something we use here at Columbia as well. And it's just a model, you plug in numbers, and it gives us a pretty good idea on probability of progression. And this also helps us decide how many hours to wear the brace, and then also will help us decide how often the child should be coming for physical therapy. About 10 years ago, even in a curve that was likely going to progress to surgery, most surgeons would say, let's wait and see what happens. Bracing is not going to work. Exercise is not going to work. You're likely going to need surgery. Thankfully, this idea has been thrown out, and now slowly surgeons are adopting a try and see approach, knowing full well, likely this child will progress to surgery, but we might buy them two years. And in those two years, they become a lot more mobile. They become a lot stronger. They have much better breath control and they're much posturally aware so that after surgery, this recovery is much quicker and much more successful. In our physical therapy evaluation, we do a very thorough assessment of posture, just seeing how the head, torso, and pelvis align. We want to see um, also a lot of scoliosis measurements such as ATR, ribcage excursion, things like that. Um, now we're also doing a very thorough assessment of their entire system, how their core functions with their breath control and how it uses to stabilize their limb and how it interplays with their scoliosis. So scoliosis specific PT looks very different for everybody. We might be doing a lot of Barcelona type shroff, doing a lot of exercise in the brace, using the wall bar with self elongation. And if the child is mature and able to, we might be doing some derotation. In the younger child, and also just to work on core, we might be using more geometric shapes, starting in quadruped, working on core strength, introducing balls for more fun. And really it's a tailored plan, depending on where they are in growth, what kind of resources they have at home, because it's important that they carry over these exercises at home, what their motivation looks like, how flexible they are. So finally, I wanna talk about can PSSC and bracing reduce scoliosis in my child? And this is um, one of the first examples of how I started playing this long game idea. The picture on the left is of a 10 year old girl who I met, she was premenarchal, she was a Sander zero, she had scoliosis. And basically I said, I knew I was gonna have a long-term relationship with her and I wanted it to be successful. Her curve progressed to bracing range. Um, I was very slow with it. We worked, you know, maybe once a month. She was very successful in the brace. She was very successful with her exercises. And in the end, the picture on the right, does she still have scoliosis? Yes. However, despite her now becoming um, physically mature, her scoliosis really didn't progress. And it's a very big success story because we would have been having a different conversation. In conclusion, there is a lot of research showing the benefits of scoliosis specific PT. Everyone has their own journey and it's important to tailor the plan to the individual needs of the child. And the goal of PSSE and bracing is to reduce curve progression, not so much to cure scoliosis or to reduce scoliosis curves. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm always available for questions. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Prachi. Great talk. And thank you very much for uh, teaching us about all the different options here. Next, you're going to hear from Amber Miserec about resources that are available for you, for your patients with spine deformity. So we're going to talk about resources for spine deformity. There's quite a lot out there, actually. And I find that, um, well, first of all, I'm Amber. I'm a physician assistant uh, here at Columbia. My only disclosure is that I uh, wrote alongside with Dr. Vitale, the scoliosis guide for children and their families. Um, so first of all, um, there's you know a lot of information out there. So families get um, this scoliosis diagnosis either um, you know from the pediatrician or somewhere outside, and then um, they start googling. And there's so much information out there. It's like an information overload. And then sometimes they get these alternative treatments that um, are not necessarily like the best treatments for them. So I find that. Um, you know, it's, it's best to give them the resources that are uh, good for them and, and good for them to uh, read about and guide them toward the right places to do their reading. Um, so it's a, it's a relationship and it's good to give them uh, these in resources so that they, they know where to go. So there's books, there's websites, there's patient connections, there's organizations. Um, so I know this is a very busy slide. There were actually more books out there than I even uh, realized that there were out there. And so uh, hopefully you can take these to your patients also. Um, so there's some non-fiction uh, books out there. The, as I mentioned, The Scoliosis, A Guide for Children and Their Families. Uh, it's at the top of the screen there. Staying Out of Trouble is more for um, the clinical practitioner. Uh, patient guide, what to expect with conservative uh, scoliosis care, uh, which is what we give out to our patients who are undergoing shroth and bracing and sort of goes through the A's to Z of everything to expect with all of that. And we have a what to expect guide for spine surgery. And then there's straight talk with curvy girls that guides uh, kids through that process as well. Then there's the fiction books. And I find that kids, you know, they don't want to feel like they're alone in this process. Sometimes they're the only kid in their school that has a brace on. And, and sometimes that's just overwhelming for them. Uh, so sometimes if you give them a book or connect them with other people who are going through the same thing, then it makes them feel like they're not alone in the process. So at the bottom of the screen, there's some books geared more toward the adolescent, uh, Judy Bloom, who I Think we're most all familiar with um, more uh, contemporary the braced uh, book who was actually written by a kid who uh, was in a brace um, who is now an adult author and then um, some additional ones the I'm bent not broken was um, published I think in 2020 or 2021 um, and then there's some additional ones listed. And then at the top of the page, there's some books sort of for the younger child. Um, there used to be a book that was published, Cole and the Crooked Flower. It's now um, hard to find as a hardcover, but it's read, written or read out loud um, on YouTube. So the parents can find it there. And then being uh, Grace and Beautiful Crooked Letter. So there's some options um, out there for the uh, younger children. And then here are some uh, useful websites, the Scoliosis National uh, Foundation, the SRS Research uh, Society, Setting Scoliosis Straight, the Curvy Girls Support Group, Shift is now on uh, Facebook, POSNA has some great, uh, and, and the AOS both have great uh, education websites for patients, Growing Spine Foundation for the younger kids, and then of course uh, we have some um, great resources as well. connecting patients with other kids who are going through the same thing. I mean, that's the whole premise of Curvy Girls. If you haven't heard of Curvy Girls, um, it's a international uh, collaboration that started in Long Island and they have um, groups internationally that meet um, sometimes once a month, sometimes less often, but then they try every other year to meet in Long Island and all the girls come together. And it's a really great thing to watch them all connecting and feeling like what they're going through is um, something that someone else is going through and it, and it normalizes it for them. And a lot of this that they go through, there is a emotional component to it that you, um, you know, as you 
have seen in the previous two slide, you know, two presentations is compliance is a big deal. And if you pay attention to the emotional part of it, then your compliance may be able to um, increase. And so I think that paying attention to the connections and the resources and addressing the anxiety and the and the questions that they have, I think can really uh, help part of that stuff. So there's patient to patient programs, there's a brace mentoring program that an orthotist started out in Texas. So bracing for scoliosis can help connect patients that are in braces. Um, there's Facebook support groups. I went on Facebook and just searched scoliosis. There's like 20 some uh, different support groups depending on um, what you're looking for. And then there's shift scoliosis. There's different organizations at the bottom. Um, there's different even clothing, um, uh, different clothing manufacturers that go uh, with different braces. Um, and then um, we're not gonna have time to watch this video, but it's on YouTube and basically it's a kid uh, telling her story. Uh, so maybe you can go back and watch this um, um, after the fact, but it um, is kind of a, sort of a neat video on YouTube about um, her scoliosis story. story. So I think it's really important to uh, educate patients to decrease their anxiety and hopefully improve their outcomes in the end. Um, just lastly, I think this is another, we, this is uh, resources for uh, spinal deformity. This is another diagnosis that it's really important to provide resources because it's often misunderstood by the, the parent. If they leave the office and don't exactly understand um, the diagnosis, then there often is a phone call um, back uh, asking questions. So I think that educational resources are really important. And so providing that to the parent when they're leaving the office is, is um, uh, important. And teamwork, I think that um, if we all work together uh, from the pediatrician, the physical therapist, the um, orthotist and um, the surgeons and the nurse practitioner and PAs, I think if we all um, work together and keep the patient and family at the center, I think that, that um, we provide the best picture for them. So thank you for your time. Great, thanks, Amber. Impressive collection of uh, resources all put together in one place, which is the first time I've actually seen that. It's, that'll be a great thing for people to come back and refer to over time. I have a question, uh, and really it's for the whole panel. And, uh, and again, I'll ask people to, uh, to uh, send in your questions and chat uh, over the next couple of minutes. We have a few minutes for Q and A. Um, you know, you and I both missed that the title of your talk was resources for spine deformity, but there is an increased emphasis and a push on the part of the curvy girls and other patient centered groups not to use the word deformity. Um, what do you think, what should we be doing? And it's really a, a, a question to everyone. I think that, you know, SRS and POSNA and, and Curvy Girls have all sort of heard this and understood the question, but um, haven't really figured out sort of a way that makes sense to communicate um, uh, accurately. So Amber, you want to start off? Yeah, I think that, you know, um, kids just want to be like normalized. You know, I hear that from like special needs kids, like they don't want to feel like not normal. And so it's the same thing with deformity, like they don't want to feel deformed. So I think that if we find like a different word that they like are okay with, um, I don't know, Prachi or Kelly, like if you, if you, what, what's the word that they're, that they're wanting us so, to use? So sort has also changed to structural spine variations um or just scoliosis but the word deformity is definitely something that i think has a bad connotation mm -hmm. i think good point I, I think that um i think that that's not just with um in the realm of spine i think that that's across the board with other things too no i mean we certainly see it in other parts of scoliosis right we used to talk about a rib hump on the forward bend which some people still use and there's a you know first to call that a rib prominence as opposed to a hump because a hump obviously has other meanings even in other places in orthopedics I meaning there's a place to get rid of club foot um which has a can have a negative connotation for some people but it's a difficult issue with the spine because it's you know point of fact it is a deformity it's not normal um, but you're also dealing with adolescent girls who are very <laughs> like you know <laughs> absolutely I'm calling it what it is, right? Like scoliosis or whatever the name of it is, right? That kind of, we're still being correct, but also taking maybe some of that stigma away. 
Um, but I totally agree with the disorders, right? We all need to see the things that we're trying to get away from. Amika, you may need to raise your volume just a little bit, but we heard what you said, and I agree with it. Um, so, Prachi, if my patient comes to me and says, I heard that I need Barcelona or um, or Schroth physical therapy, what do I tell them? Do I tell them that that the names don't really matter? Do I tell them that um, to look up someone who's certified only in Schroth? What do I tell the sort of patient who's really trying to understand because they heard that their best friend got cured with Schroth? Um, so I think scoliosis specific PT, um, asking about the, so the big certifications are the BS PTS, um, the SAIA certification, um, Schroff from Dr. Weiss. Um, I think Marissa mentioned also in the chat, uh, uh, ISST. Um, so it's just, um, I, I think the, the referral list is very powerful as well. Just knowing, you know, that that all your therapists are certified. Got it. Um, at flip side for you, Dr. Vitale, say a, a family comes to you and they just got a brace, but it's a terrible fitting brace and they paid you know thousands of dollars to get this brace and insurance didn't cover. What is your thought of getting them a new brace? Do you wait? Um, how often are you know are they getting reimbursed from insurance? That's always a very important question that families ask. And it's a hard one. It happens all the time. Not a week goes by that I, I get a kid who has a brace that I'm really not comfortable is helping him or her at all. Um, either because the x-ray in the brace shows that or, or because it's poor fitting or because it's only being used you know, at nighttime, a lot of it has to do with um, the kid's risk of progression. And as you know, we formally quantify risk using uh, braced data. So if a kid has a 4% risk of progression, I talk a little bit differently with that family than if they have an 80 uh, or 90% chance of progression. The truth is that the insurance companies generally will not pay for um, the second brace to be made um, in the same year if it's only um, because of the style of brace. So sometimes you can get around it by dictating a strong letter about uh, the fit of the brace or causing skin problems, but it's a tricky thing. And then, of course, when we just say that this type of brace, um, I don't think it's helping you because it's not improving the curve um, three-dimensionally or even in the frontal plane, of course, then you have to manage the previous uh, physician who prescribed that brace and the previous orthotist who's just down the street. So these are all very real world issues. They're tough issues. Um, but I think, you know, our job primarily is to educate the patients and let them make decisions about uh, next you have steps. An X-ray that shows that it doesn't, doesn't uh, correct the curve at all in the brace that could also be helpful um, in a letter of medical necessity to the insurance. Well, we are um, so we are right on time. We should probably move on to our okay. next session. And I will ask uh, Ben Roy, my partner for a long time, a long time and a great scoliosis uh, doctor to uh, uh, launch the next person. The first talk is entitled, When It Is Not Just Back Pain. Uh, my name is Benjamin Roy. I uh, work with uh, Michael Vitale and all our other wonderful panelists. Uh, I do uh, uh, pediatric orthopedic uh, spine surgery. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about back pain in kids not sort of the run-of-the-mill back pain uh, that kids will come in and complain about, but some of the, the maybe the more esoteric things uh, that you don't see very often, but need to have some sense of when to when to kind of look for, when to have your guard up, when to be a little bit more alert. So as we've heard, you know, and we'll continue to hear this evening, back pain is really not at all uncommon in kids. However, rarely is the diagnosis dangerous. It's unusual for it to be something we need to worry about or act upon urgently. Um, however, when you do look at the rates of more concerning diagnoses, it does seem to be a little bit higher in the pediatric population than in the adult population. So the goal of the next 10 minutes is to try to understand when it's important to get your guard up. We don't have an image, uh, um, sorry, we don't have to image or refer every child with a complaint. We need to do this by recognizing what the red flags are in this population and, and then getting a sense of when to refer patients and when to refer them urgently. When, when do we really need to, to get concerned? So certainly, uh, when we're looking at the red flags, one is going to be a history of acute antecedent trauma, and that 
you know, basically just means that there was a there was a single event injury that immediately afterwards their back started hurting. I fell, my back started hurting, and this is especially uh, going to be a red flag if it's a higher energy mechanism. For example, somebody fell off, you know, from a height of you know eight or ten feet, maybe on playground equipment, on the ladder, or certainly if they were involved in any sort of uh, vehicular accident, vehicular accident, whether it's a bike or a car or something like that. Um, and again, a lot of these um, red flags and things that are more urgent, for the most part, are going to be pretty obvious to you. Um, not a lot of things that are esoteric. You know, neurologic symptoms in the setting of trauma, of course, are going to be urgent. Uh, we're looking at things like pain that's radiating down the legs, especially below the knee. Obviously, any changes to the motor or sensory exam, changes in bowel or bladder habits, or just severe pain, all of these things really should be worked up either in an ER or certainly um, in very short order in, uh, in an orthopedist's office. Some of the other red flags, and again, you really, I think, know most of these, uh, a young age. So kids that are you know, preschool age in particular who are complaining of persistent back pain, that's probably something that you're gonna really wanna look into and evaluate further. Um, this is a big one with me, and I think a, a lot of people who do what I do, um, asking about a functional disability. And by that, I mean, is the child voluntarily removing themselves from activities they normally enjoy? If you've got a, a child that's complaining and says, my back hurts when I'm in bed or if I'm sitting down or, um, uh, or standing or walking for a long time, but when they're out playing with their friends, playing basketball or, or things like that, and their back doesn't really bother them that much, I'm much less concerned about this being an issue. Um, systemic symptoms, absolutely. Fever, weight loss, you know, we're looking for tumors, things like that. Uh, any, again, any neurologic changes, even in the setting without trauma, if there are any of these changes, that's something that needs to be worked up pretty urgently. Um, night pain. Again, night pain might be growing pains, but of course, if, if the primary primary complaint is back pain, it certainly could be something else. Uh, again, thinking on the infection or tumor spectrum. Uh, and this is another one, duration of pain that can sometimes get a little bit tricky. So if the pain has been there for a couple of days, usually you don't need to get overly concerned about it unless there's other really concerning symptoms. But if you've got a child that's persistently complaining of pain for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, um, that's something that should probably be worked up a little bit. Now, if they've been complaining of pain for like six or seven years, I've, I've seen kids where the, the mom tells me, you know, a six-year-old's been complaining of pain in his back for five years, I'm probably not so worried about that, because um, if that was something bad, it almost certainly would have declared itself. Um, but, but somewhere within that time frame, I think you, you need to, to be concerned and, and take some next steps to further evaluate it. Uh, and then finally, new or rapid progression of any sort of underlying structural change in their spinal alignment or deformity. Um, you know, if somebody comes in, they've got back pain, and you'd seen them a couple months ago, their back looked fine, and now all of a sudden they've got a scoliosis, you know, that's definitely a red flag that needs to be worked up. So what do we do with this red flag? Well, I think the first and easiest thing to do is to image the spine. Radiographs are an easy, simple, cheap, and safe way to do it. Um, digital films really offer not very much radiation at all. Um, a full scoliosis series, I think, is ideal, even if they're just complaining about low back pain. Um, certainly, my office will get a full scoli series. Uh, the uh, likelihood of potentially seeing something, especially from an alignment standpoint, that's outside the, the realm of that lumbosacral spine is, is certainly there, uh, and it, you won't miss anything by doing that. I do think if you're considering additional imaging, like an MRI or a CT, I would probably refer the patient out to have that study uh, ordered to make sure that the proper study is ordered and make sure we know exactly what we're looking for. Um, second easy test to do is laboratory studies, just basic inflammatory labs. These are going to include your CBC, ESR, and CRP. In our area, I think getting a line as well is certainly uh, makes sense. Not going to be a common cause. Uh, but these will uh, rule in or out a fair number of different diagnoses. And if both of these studies are normal, there's a lot less to be worried about. And you can probably sit on it a little bit longer, maybe try some you know, other conservative interventions before uh, going the next step. So I thought it might be interesting to do some case-based presentations of some more unusual presentations of back pain, uh, or at least un unusual diagnoses, uh, to get a sense of what some of these things might end up looking like. So this is case one, a 12-year-old girl. Uh, when I met her um, last year, she was um, had been having back pain for about eight months. She was having pain day and night, not really activity-related, but it was present during activity for sure. Um, ibuprofen was helpful, but only for a few hours. Um, when I met her, you know, her initial exam was pretty unremarkable. X-rays didn't really show much, maybe a very small, subtle curve, but nothing at all worrisome or treatable. Um, and so we tried some additional conservative interventions, but four months later, she presented with this. So she clearly had the scoliosis, which was not there just a few months before. So this is a, a major red flag, something that we need to kind of work on further. 
So uh, she was indicated at this point for an advanced workup. And again, this was based on her persistent symptoms, symptoms for almost a year now, uh, failed conservative uh, interventions, and a new rapid onset of uh, spinal deformity. And she had a CT scan. And what we can see here is uh, findings that, that are pathognomonic for osteoid osteoma, which is a benign tumor uh, of bone. You can see there's uh, a red, I'm sorry, a, um, a shell of bone with a nidus in the middle. And again, that, that really makes your diagnosis for you. You don't even need a tissue diagnosis based on that CT finding. Um, and so with her, we were able to, to take her to the OR, resect the uh, small tumor. Uh, her pain was gone the moment she woke up. She certainly had post-surgical pain, but that chronic gnawing pain from this tumor was gone. Uh, her scoliosis resolved. They actually just saw her earlier today, and she had a 30-degree curve, which is now down to six degrees um, about six or eight months after surgery. So, so she's uh, doing great. Okay, case number two. This is a six-year-old boy who presented with a couple of months of progressive low back pain. Uh, you can see he's just not standing normally. He's, he's crouching. His hips are flexed. He's lost his lumbar lordosis. No history of any fevers or trauma. Um, on exam, he certainly had a lot of pain in his lower back, pain with movement. He didn't want to move around very much. Um, but neurologically, everything looked normal. So again, this is a clear, there's, this kid's having a lot of pain. It's been a couple of months, we need to do something. Obviously, this was not his initial presentation because you can see he already has an IV, but we got some x-rays. Um, again, further imaging based on these red flags, chronic pain, change in posture, laboratory studies were really not all that telling, but the x-rays did show a diminished uh, height of the disc between some of this uh, lower lumbar vertebra. You can see generally the, the light space between the bones, which is the disc height, that generally gets bigger as you go down um, and it's clearly diminished over here. And an MRI kind of confirmed our diagnosis by showing a lot of edema in the bone and in the disc in that area uh, on these T2 weighted films. And this is a diagnosis of discitis, which is something not terribly common, about one in every uh, uh, 200,000 uh, kids will have this, but um, but it's important to make the diagnosis. It needs to be treated usually just uh, medically with antibiotics, although uh, in recalcitrant cases, you can try aspiration and or uh, debridement, but that's a pretty unusual. Um, case three is a 10-year-old girl who presents with several months of mid-thoracic back pain, no history of trauma. Um, you know, it seems to be there all the time, maybe a little bit worse with activity. Her neuro exam was similarly normal. Um, she did get x-rays again based on duration of symptoms and um, you know things have been going on for a while. Just plain x-rays show significant compression of one of her vertebra. Uh, MRI showed some increased signal in this area as well, but no soft tissue mass. Um, so these findings here are, um, are pretty consistent with uh, vertebra plana, which is really a descriptive term describing a flat vertebra. Uh, and while certainly it can be caused by Pox disease, which is a tuberculosis, we don't really see that today. Uh, so this is almost certainly Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which again is a benign tumor, uh, often you know found in children. When it's a solitary lesion such as this, it would be considered eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, these are typically treated with observation uh, unless they're causing significant deformity, which is pretty uncommon. So. Um, I'd like to wrap up now, and in, in summary, kids do complain a lot about their backs, but through use of a systematic approach to help identify those needing a more thorough workup, and this is going to include uh, duration of symptoms, impact of symptoms on activities, that's a big one, uh, the presence of any underlying alignment issues or deformity, uh, certainly systemic symptoms or neurologic symptoms. Um, we can then go ahead and take some additional steps such as imaging labs and referral out. And again, please don't be afraid to contact your local uh, neighborhood uh, PD pod for further uh, advice. We're happy to help. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any uh, questions and feel free to, to use my email. Thanks, Ben. It's a lot of pros in that uh, 10 minute talk. And we'll open it up uh, now um, for Amika George, a nurse practitioner in our group, to speak a little bit about pediatric spine care for the primary care provider. I think about half of the participants tonight are primary care providers. So, and thank you for joining us and thank you, Amika, for uh, teaching us. Oh gosh. Well, thanks, Dr. Rajali, for that. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Okay. Can you guys see everything? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So thanks, Dr. Vitali, and thank you guys for having me tonight. I'm Amika George. I'm one of the nurse practitioners in the um, Columbia Orthopedics Group. I work with Dr. Vitali and Dr. Benjamin Roy, who are both here. Um, and I'm trained in primary care, so I'm very excited to speak with you guys tonight and hopefully provide some useful tips and guidance on sort of when to refer and just general um, little pearls for pediatric um, spine. So, Tonight, I just sort of want to focus on 
three main topics. So of course, just some common diagnoses that you'll certainly be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis and some referral tips. And then I'm gonna end with um, three case presentations of um, patients I've seen over the past year or so. Okay. So we just had a great talk with Dr. Roy on back pain. So of course you will certainly be seeing a lot and you know, most of the time it's probably just mechanical back pain, but you've got to know, right? That differential and sort of when to refer to us. So thank you, Dr. Roy, for that. Um, scoliosis, you'll see a lot of kyphosis, which is sort of that postural um, orientation of the back, the sideward bend um, with virtual learning this year and COVID and all the screen time, definitely. I'm sure you've been seeing a lot more slouchy kids and maybe parents concerned about that. Um, so kyphosis is another thing you'll see. And then lastly, you'll see leg length discrepancies. And sometimes um, that can kind of uh, give a false sense of a scoliosis. And you'll see that in one of the cases. But uh, depending on the study, anywhere from 40 to 70% of people have a leg length discrepancy. So that's definitely something that you will encounter as well. Okay. So moving on, I just want to talk about when to refer. Um, so this is obviously the bread and butter of primary care, right? Um, just sort of the most important question that, you know, when I was in primary care, I was asking myself constantly. Um, so I'm hoping that these little things will help. So the first thing is I put any child with a positive Adams forward bend test, but I would kind of caveat that with certainly a young child with a positive test, I would refer sort of without hesitation. It, you know, it gives us time to intervene, you know, if treatment's needed. Um, if you see a kid that maybe looks like they have a leg length difference or a shoulder asymmetry, like those would all be reasons, um, you know, to send them our way as well. And then I would also definitely pay attention to family history of scoliosis. We know that there's a large genetic component to this too. So if mom mentions casually during the visit that maybe she had surgery for scoliosis, definitely get your, your guard up to, to you know, pay close attention to that child. Um, and of course, back pain, we talked about with Dr. Roy sort of the red flags and when to refer. Um, so I won't spend time and we have a whole section on back pain coming up. But certainly, you know, history is key and um, that will sort of help guide your decision making. And then I'm a really firm believer in this last bullet point, sort of whenever you're on the fence or uncertain about something, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you'll never regret, you know, referring a kid that you thought had scoliosis. And then it turned out that they were fine. The parents are super happy with that reassurance and happy to see us and we're happy to see them. So I would definitely say anytime you're unsure to send them our way. And then um, this is a nice infographic that I found um, from Chalk um, out in LA. And I think that, of course, I would caution using it as a gold standard, but definitely something that I think will help with your sort of workup and you know when to refer kind of with some concrete criteria. Um, but like, for example, at the top, you know, it mentions if a child has a scoliometer reading of less than five and they don't need an x-ray and they don't need a referral. But I would again, think about that family history. And if there was someone with surgery or wore a brace when they were younger, a cousin, a sibling, then even with that small amount of rotation, would probably at least get a full scoliosis series or, um, or refer. So then I'm gonna move on to a couple of cases. So this is, um, this first one's a five-year-old that I actually saw a couple of weeks ago, um, presented to the pediatrician for a well child check. Um, they did a forward bend test on him. And obviously he looked like this. When I saw him, you know, mom actually didn't know that she had scoliosis. She called it a large double S curve. Um, and she said that was diagnosed when she was about 19. And the child is otherwise in good health. He has no back pain. And I think this is a pretty like classic referral, right? And then his x-ray is on the right. And it turns out that he has a 35 degree scoliosis. We were able to initiate full-time bracing on him, Schroth physical therapy and vitamin D supplementation. So I thought this was a good example of, you know, a young child with a positive test to like definitely send them to us. Um, and he has that family history, right? Mom didn't quite know what her curve was or, you know, she knew that she didn't have any treatment, but 
again, it's just these little things that might just kind of casually come up in conversation can make all the difference. And then second case, this is a little trickier. It's a nine year old girl. She presents for a well check. You're talking to mom and she mentions that she herself wore a brace for scoliosis when she's a teen. Um, the young lady is asymptomatic. She has no back pain. She's otherwise healthy. And her scoliometer reading is only three. Very subtle rotation on that Adam's test. So if you're using the guideline that I used before, you know, the, the recommendation was not to refer them. But it turns out that she has a 20 degree scoliosis and um, likely kind of matching her mom's pattern. So it was great because we were able to start, I actually saw them with Dr. Roy, we were able to start part-time bracing with her. Um, and now I think her curve is in the teens. So she's responded really well to it, tolerated it well. So I thought this is a good example of just, you know, early referral and intervention and the power of that. And of course, family history. And then this is the final case. So this is an 11 year old I saw a couple of months ago. We're actually referred for scoliosis, no family history, no back pain, but he has a positive forward bend. You can see there his left, um, he has a left thoracic prominence. But you also can see if you look closely that his left shoulder is up, his left hip is also higher. So we saw him in the office, got a formal x-ray. He looks like he's got a 21 degree curve. But then you also see that his left hip is higher than the right. So we decided to repeat this study with him um, with a block under his right, the shorter leg. And then it turns out, you know, he's leaning off a little bit, probably felt weird, you know, using that lift, but his scoliosis is completely gone. And so this was a great referral because the PCP thought he had scoliosis, but he wound up having a leg length discrepancy and something that we're still going to continue to observe, you know, as he grows. So I guess I want to close with, you know, even though this child did not have scoliosis, it was still an appropriate and wonderful referral because they were relieved that he didn't have it, but now he has a leg length difference that we need to watch, you know, as he grows. So final thoughts. Um, as the primary care provider, you're the first line, you make all the difference. We know that it's a busy day and I know that with, you know, real life experience that it's tough to kind of keep up with all of them the whole child, but I'm hoping that the talks tonight will sort of help, you know, hone in on some of those key history and physical exam. And just, you have that power to reassure and, and refer the kids you're worried about. So thank you guys again, so much for your time. Feel free to chat or message me, you know, after the talk, my email's there. Thank you guys. Thanks, Amika, great talk. And I'll just stress that in our practice, Amika and Amber and some of the other advanced practice providers are the primary care providers and they see kids with broken arms and leg length differences and in towing and scoliosis. So um, really appreciate your insight sort of straddling both worlds as a super specialist and at the same time, a primary care provider. Um, so uh, uh, my first question will be for Ben. Uh, you mentioned that you think that uh, the pediatrician primary care provider should not necessarily order an MRI or CT. Can you um, expound on that? We get lots of um, MRIs on kids who have back pain that are sent in that show a bulging disc or whatever. Um, what's the downside of that? Right. I mean, I think as you alluded to, there's always the um, unintended consequence of finding something that may not really be related to, to what you're actually worried about. Um, and, and is my audio better? I apologize. I found out after my talk that there was an issue. Okay, I changed mics. Um, so, you know, case in point, you know, almost, you know, so many people have bulging discs and, and uh, you know, somebody who isn't necessarily as familiar with this is going to look at that and be concerned about it. I get referrals for bulging discs all the time. Families now have tremendous access to their medical records, which is appropriate, but when they read a report that they're not necessarily you know, trained to read and understand, they kind of get freaked out by this and think, oh my gosh, he has a herniated disc and he's going to need surgery and things like that. Um, and there's other things too, as we know, this, this uh, you know, unintended consequences, even finding something completely unrelated, like maybe I had a kid that ended up having a liver biopsy for an incidental finding on an unnecessary MRI of some benign cyst in his liver, which led to this major surgery, which was, which was for nothing. So, um, you know, not that that happens all the time, but, but we need to think very carefully about what we're looking for when we're ordering these tests and, and why we're ordering it. 
Got it. Okay, and um, thanks. Uh, and now for the last talk in this session, I'll actually ask Prachi to introduce Ian Leahy, um, who is a physical therapist. He'll be speaking on spine health and developing athlete. Thanks, Prachi, and thank you, Ian. Thanks, Dr. Vitali. So Ian is an incredible physical therapist. He comes to us from CHOP. He is the lead clinician in both the sports medicine and the spine medicine program. He is an Ironman. He is my go-to for any athlete, especially with spine pain, scoliosis. And we're so grateful that he is giving us this talk. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Prati. I appreciate it. Let me make sure I can get everything up here. Hopefully everyone can see that and hopefully everyone can hear me as well. Uh, so first off, thank you so much to, to Columbia, Univers <clears throat> Columbia University and Prachi uh, for inviting me to do this talk. Um, it's an absolute honor to be sharing this platform with some of you. Um, and hopefully I can, I can add a little bit to it because this has been uh, phenomenal so far. Um, so I have the pleasure of speaking about kind of that, the kind of the healthy athletic population um, in the, in the adolescent world. And it's the population that I see predominantly at CHOP. Um, so this is something that's really near and dear to me. And, and hopefully you guys can, can take something away from this. Um, I have no disclosures regarding this talk at all. So when you look at the, the research that's out there for the causation of back pain, predominantly they're done in the adult population. Um, and, and, you know, they look at those things that, that we're already familiar with, the, the age-related degenerative changes that happen, the flexibility deficits, and, and some of those kind of psychosocial issues that, that we know can cause back pain and, and the, the chronicity of back pain. But the problem with these studies is that we have to remember that children are not just small version of adults, right? So there's a lot of physiological things that are different in the growing individual that we have to take into account. We can't use these studies and assume that these causative factors for back pain are going to be the same in a relatively healthy athlete. Um, so just last year, a group from South America decided to look at exactly this issue and they, they wanted to look at the high school age population and they wanted to compare it to the variables that we know are causative factors of, of back pain in the adult population. And they, they had a relatively large study. Um, and what they saw was that spinal pain really runs the gamut of not just low back, but throughout the neck and the thoracic spine as well. But more importantly, the take home from it was that the things that we know can be causative factors of back pain in adults, things such as flexibility deficits, particularly in the hamstrings, sex, weight, the sagittal profile of the spine, these were not predictive of back pain in high school individuals. Um, so this is different. This is something that we really have to now look closer at. And, but for me, the one big limitation of this study is that these weren't in athletes. These were in non-athletic individuals who are of a high school age. And the reason that this is extremely important is that the number one predictor of back pain in a high school aged individual was sedentary behavior. And what they labeled as sedentary behavior was greater, anything greater than two hours at a time of either tablet time, video game playing, or just sitting really not moving. So uh, this is gonna be a take home message, hopefully that, that everyone has, because in this time, of COVID with virtual learning, I think we fail to recognize kind of the importance of those changing positions in school, whether it be changing classrooms or having a break of a matter of time where you can go walk around the schoolyard. You know, my, my kids are, are guilty of this, of sitting in front of the computer for hours on end for school. And therefore they're kind of feeding into this, this two hours of sedentary behavior. But again, the, the problem with this study in regards to the patients that I see is that when you're dealing with athletes, regardless of the, letter, le the, the level of athletic performance, you know, you're not going to see a lot of that sedentary behavior. So when, when you're talking about the prevalence of spine pain in the athlete, we have to kind of step back and we have to look at other potential causes. The reason we have to start looking at this a little bit closer is that the reports now are showing increases in back pain of upwards of 35%. Um, I've had discussions with physicians at CHOP um, where we firmly believe that this number is actually on the low side. 
Um, and, and the reason we think that is that, you know, when you think about the athlete, a lot of times those initial onset of symptoms are not going to be reported and they're not going to be reported due to fear of losing playing time due to pressure from coaches, recruiters, from parents. So even though 35% at a high school age is, is a really high number, it, it's scary to think that this number could potentially be higher. Um, just a couple of years ago in the Journal of Sports Medicine, they broke down the prevalence of spine pain in individual sports. And one of the big take homes that, that I wanted to highlight here is that two very common sports in the mid-Atlantic region that we see a lot at, at CHOP are both football and volleyball. And the reason that I wanted to bring highlight to these is that they're two very different type of sports where football, you're looking at more of those contact related injuries and volleyball is more of the overuse related injuries. But when you look at the lifetime prevalence of back pain in these athletes, they can range anywhere from 38 to 67 percent. So that kind of first line defense that Amika spoke about is really critical with this patient population. And when we compare the non-athletic group with the athletes, we can see that there are statistically significant differences when you're dealing with the diagnosis of low back pain. So the question that we always have at CHOP is, can we assist in preventing low back pain? And, and as we all know, it, it's really hard. And the reason it's really hard is that primary prevention studies require an extremely large sample size. And even if you are able to, to collaborate with, with other institutions to generate this large sample size, the question then becomes, do primary prevention create overtreatment in the low back pain patient? And we, are, we already know the, the mess that this makes when it comes to costs in healthcare, that even though these studies may be really beneficial, are we just adding to that cost of overtreatment? So at CHOP, what we look at is we look more at the secondary prevention because we know from research that the secondary rates of low back pain can be upwards of 70%. So secondary prevention can be extremely helpful in, in trying to kind of curtail this issue. But there's also problems with these as well. You know, to prevent these type of secondary prevention strategies, it needs to be scalable and it needs to be acceptable. And in the other way is that the exercise programs, they have to be effective. And that's a really challenging thing to measure because everyone's gonna respond differently to different exercise programs. So then what do we do? At CHOP, I've been the lead of a, a few research projects that have been IRB approved that we're currently looking at right now. And what we're looking at is we're looking at more importantly, the movement coordination of an athlete. So if you go back to that original study from 2020 that said that the hamstring length was not a predictor of back pain in the non-athletic population, we are trying to take that and we're trying to say, okay, there are gonna be flexibility deficits in a growing individual. We know this, we know that bone grows faster than soft tissue. And therefore we expect flexibility deficits when an athlete comes through our office. However, what we wanna look more closely at is we wanna look at how that flexibility deficit affects the movement that is required for that individual, whether it be a specific movement in their sport that generates symptoms or a specific movement in their training that they have been able to report that this is what caused the back pain over repetitive use. So we're currently looking at things like the prone hip extension. We're looking at things like the prone trunk extension, where when we know there's flexibility deficits, we want to see how that flexibility deficit creates inhibition of certain muscle groups that we really want them to be using to eliminate stress across the back. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, a lot of the, the data collection that we were kind of moving full steam with was, was put on hold, but our hopes is that we're gonna start to kind of pick this up again and start moving forward and, and hopefully have some good data to, to start presenting. But the, the big question becomes, why are we seeing more back pain in the adolescent athlete? And I think it has to do with a lot with when we're seeing a, a lot more orthopedic related issues in the, in the adolescent athlete, and that's sports specialization. 
you know, there's been more and more talk about sports specialization. There, there's kind of two thoughts on this. One is that specializing in a sport does not increase the likelihood of, of any chance of injury. And then there's the side that says, no, if you, if you specialize in one sport too early or you train at an elite level while still skeletally immature, you increase the risk of these overuse injuries. Um, so this, this is data that was taken out of the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And what it showed was that when you're increasing the time training, when you're increasing your normal hours of recreational activity, and then you're increasing your hours of sports with it being only one sport, that chance of serious overuse injuries is high. Now, this study did not just specify the low back, but if we think about in terms of the spine, these serious overuse injuries could be things such as a, a spondylolysis, which then can transition into a spondylolisthesis if it's bilateral. So these are things that we really have to start taking into account when we're dealing with that athletic population. Because in the end, when, when we have this kind of growing athlete, we have to worry about their demand is outweighing their capacity and therefore something has to fail whether it be the pars with a spondy or whether it be soft tissue tears or whether it be a disc issue um, we have to start thinking about this these kids are training at, at much higher levels at such a young age that i really do feel that their demand and what they're being asked to do from recruiters and coaches and parents is is really outweighing what they're able to withstand and so really the, the biggest take home message that I want, so for, for primary care physicians, number one, edu you know, educate your, your adolescent patients on back pain. Let them know that if this is their first onset of symptoms, how important it is to manage those symptoms now because of the high rate of secondary symptoms down the road. Um, also, based upon that article of sedentary behavior being the highest predictor of back pain, encourage activity. If you have a younger patient who is not an athlete, who does spend more time playing video games or have tablet time or watching TV, encourage activity, encourage movement. You know, most of my patients that I treat who aren't athletes, um, if my scoliosis patients, one of the biggest things I have them do is in class. I have them every 15 minutes, just change position. If they're shifted on one side, shift to the other. I just want them to get used to moving throughout that day and avoiding those sedentary behaviors. And then the big thing, you are the first line of defense with this. And then it really it falls onto the, the rehab clinicians is discouraging that sports specialization. You know, play multiple sports. If they have no interest in playing multiple sports, really try and, and push for having a true off season. And then also try to talk with the families about eliminating elite training when they're still skeletally immature. Let's try to decrease those chance of those serious overuse type injuries. And then from a PT or an ATC perspective, doing that thorough evaluation, you know, when you have that young skeletally immature patient, flexibility deficit is, is okay, it's expected. And if you have asymmetrical flexibility deficits, then doing those straight plane stretches is fine and it's probably beneficial. But don't assume that that flexibility deficit is what caused the back pain. There, there may be studies showing that that's not the case. However, start to look at what the movement is that's required for their sport or what movement is required for their training and then see how that flexibility deficit may be increasing the stress across the spine. I think that if we put all of this together, we may be able to start to catch these kids early in the process and potentially drop that secondary low back pain from that high 70 percentile down to where I think it can be much more manageable. Um, but thank you again. And if there's any questions, please don't ever hesitate to, to reach out. Thank you, Ian. That was awesome. So much of that resonated with, uh, I, I know, lots of people in the faculty and lots of people on the call. Uh, I'll ask anyone, uh, the 120 participants, if they have any questions for any of the previous round of speakers. Ian, I, maybe I'll start off by asking you, you know, what I love that slide about the balance between capacity and demand, and the demands certainly are going up in today's world. How do you counsel that uh, super driven family, and I, I, I heard you allude uh, to it, 
um, that uh, maybe it's not the best thing for this kid to be a four season, whatever athlete. Do you cite some of the data that you're talking about? Do you just say they have more longevity? Um, what tricks can you give us to sort of help the parent to relax a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it really, it's split down the middle. You have the, the patient and the families that when you bring that data to them and you talk to them about how we're, we're being able to see the higher chances of injury with this sports specialization, they look at that and right away they they realize that they've been making mistakes and they pull back and it's, it's beneficial to everybody, the, the, the whole kind of the group treating that patient. But then you get the group, you know, when, where I work at CHOP, we're, we're on the main line, which is kind of this higher social economic class where these, these kids are going and they're doing their normal high school training. Then they have personal trainers and then they have individual trainers for speed and agility. And these parents just, they don't want to hear it. They, they want their kid to be that kind of next elite athlete who is getting that full scholarship. And, you know, my mentality is I can at least give them the information and they can choose to, to do with it what they want. We got another question from the audience for you. Do, do patients ever report muscle exhaustion due to wearing a brace for a long time? And this person goes on to say that when and he just wears a posture shirt for an hour a day, over the course of a week, it wears him out. How do you deal with back pain in the setting of uh, bracing? Is that open for everyone or just? Well, why don't you start off with it? So, uh, you know, we, we don't see a lot of, we don't brace patients with spondies and things like that. Um, we have had patients use the, the compression shirts to help with some of that, just the stability. But again, you know, we try to educate on the, we don't want them using that almost like a, a crutch in sense of, we want them out of it and trying to use their own core muscles and their postural muscles. And, and really the, the thing I try to drive home is that spinal proprioception, understanding the position that they're in for extended periods of time. That's why I, I, I try to stress with my patients that 15 minutes of a posture check. So for my scoliosis patients, I tell them when that 15 minute timer goes off, don't change the position. Just simply see where you are. Are you loading one side more than the other? And then make the adjustment. And then when that next 15 minutes comes, do that posture assessment again and see, did you fall back into that original one or were you able to maintain the new position that you have? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, from other uh, people in the faculty, the pain with bracing is a tricky thing because the brace probably does weaken your core if you're super compliant about it. Uh, and to me, that's part of the role of Shrat uh, PT. But Ben, what do you tell a patient who has new onset back pain after initiation and bracing? Sure, um, specifically for scoliosis we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, for, in that setting, you know, part of it is just, maybe is it just them getting used to the brace? Is it making sure it's not something obvious? Is there pressure in a certain area that's a problem? But if it does seem to be more sort of, you know, muscular skeletal pain, just from the way that they're being held, you may need to, a couple of things that you can do, expand the weaning time into the brace or, or not weaning time, but build up time uh, that they're doing. But as you said, a really important part of that is working on their muscles, right? They're not, their muscles are tight and you know asymmetric and we're trying to push them into a new position that they're not used to um, and most kids if they do the therapy will respond of course you say that all the time right if, if you respond if you do the therapy you should get better but but we know how, how you know rarely that happens um, actually if I could I, I wanted to ask Ian another quick question and, and then follow up with one for Amika too um, you know one of the things which you mentioned which we see all the time is you know training like an elite athlete right and and how much is too much i mean the obvious ones in our world i think for me is mostly gymnastics right these girls will practice 18 20 you know 22 hours a week you know got you know 11 year old premenarchal girls doing this and and spondies and them are a dime a dozen um you know but sometimes I'll, i will have parents ask like well, well how much is too much and how do you determine that because i know that number is different for everybody right every body is different not every body can take the same level of stress and you, you show that very nicely with that with that graph between how much what the demands are and what their capacity is. And, um, you know, how, how do you, is there, is there a way outside of just saying you need a, a season off? Is there a way to kind of look at number of hours per week or things like that? Yeah, you know, that's a, it's a great question. It's a question that comes up a lot. And I think you have to look at the individual sport. You know, I think gymnastics is one that, that definitely plays a role with those overuse type injuries. And then you get into things like your long distance running patients. 
you know, the, one of the big things we try to stress with our patients, because we don't have that, that clear cut answer is we, we really try to get a patient to agree to at least take one day off of everything during the week. This way, there's at least 24 hours where they're not putting their body through that stress. Now, is that enough to, to prevent some of those injuries? I don't know, but it, it at least is that, that chunk of time where they get away from their training. Unfortunately, with things like gymnastics, the, the demand is just too high and they don't do it. Um, and, and to change tracks a little bit, but I wanna give Amika a little, uh, a little time as well here. Um, you know, one of the things which I really enjoyed about your talk, you know, was that, that, you know, presentation of that, you know, five-year-old that had a 35 degree curve, which is pretty big. And the exam, while noticeable, was certainly not overwhelming. Um, and maybe you could just talk a little bit more about, about that and, and, you know, what we use for thresholds or things like that for, for, you know, referring patients for imaging and, and further evaluation. Oh, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, no, thanks, Dr. Roy. That's actually a patient I sent you, um, like, because I was seeing them when we were together, I think. But um, I agree, you know, that's what makes scoliosis so difficult. And we talk about this a lot where you can have, you know, three diff three kids, they have the same clinical appearance, maybe just like him, right? Maybe five, like five or six degrees of rotation, something like that. And then he had a 35 degree curve. We'll have another kid with nothing. They just have rotation. So that's important too for pediatricians um, and primary care providers to know that you can have a kid who looks like case number one and they have no scoliosis. Um, so certainly it can be difficult to distinguish that and you need an x-ray. That's the only way to know. So I agree with Ben, you know, during his talk, if you can get a full scoliosis series, that would be best. We can see everything. Um, or send it to us and, you know, we'll be able to, to get a, in, in the city, we have an EOS machine, which is also nice. So you can see their legs and everything. So, um, so certainly that clinical appearance can always be tricky, but I think if you see it, even a subtle bit of rotation, it's always good to be on the safe side. To me, that, that's the real take home point here, which is that there's such variability between the clinical appearance and what you see radiographically. And I'd much rather see a few kids with some rotation and nothing on x-ray then miss the kid where you missed an opportunity to intervene because you know somebody was following them and said, oh, there's really not much rotation here. I'm not gonna do anything about it. We see it all the time. Um, and it's, it's the way I think people are trained, but, but I, I think there you know, can be some changes in that. And especially for the young you know, kid around adolescence or certainly pre-adolescent with any, you know, with anything that you, that's pretty, that you can see, you know, I'd, I'd love to see that kid. Okay. Well, great, uh, it's a great session and we could go on and on, but we uh, should get to the next session about back pain. I'm going to introduce Prachi Bakarania, uh, the uh, co-host of uh, this program tonight, and one of the amazing Shroff physical therapists at our place. We'll lead off the next session and introduce Amber, please. Thanks, Dr. Vitali. It's my pleasure to introduce Amber. She wears lots of hats in our institution, um, and I'm so grateful that she's talking to us about back pain in the adolescent. Thanks, Amber. You guys can see this? Yes, you're good, Amber. Okay. All right. So, you know, the good thing about having different, uh, I know there's some overlap between, um, you know, talking about back pain, we're hearing it, you know, several different times tonight, but the thing is, you know, back pain in adolescence is on the rise, especially with, you know, COVID and virtual learning. And so, um, you know, there is sort of a method to the madness of hearing it several times tonight. Um, there is some overlap, but from hearing it from different directions, you're going to hear, Again, some overlap, but also some different perspectives and, and different things that different people say and hopefully um, glean uh, some things from each one of us um, and different viewpoints. Some of the things that some of the surgeons say are different from what the physical therapist is going to say and different from maybe what a nurse practitioner, or phys or, you know, physician assistant is going to say or different than what we think maybe the pediatrician will say to the patient. So. Um, anyway, here we go. So uh, again, like I said, back pain is on the rise. Um, by age 15, between 20 to 70% of children have reported back pain. Uh, most of the time, it's, you know, strain and injury over use. Um, also, you have another subset of kids who are like the gamers, sedentary, they're on the couch, they're not very active, and you don't really know what the cause is. But <clears throat> You know, the thought is there's like more of a weaker core, they're not very active. And then like um, Dr. Roy talked about, there's sort of the less common uh, things such as infection, tumor, trauma, um, scoliosis, kyphosis, spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, 
Um, so those are, again, some less common classes. Um, some questions to ask, you heard um, some of these um, or um, many of these with uh, Dr. Roy. Um, some of the red flags to cover first are like if you hear about night pain, um, numbness or tingling, bowel or bladder issues, radiating into the arms or legs. If you hear the parent say, mm, he's walking a little bit differently, like those are things that sort of get my ear a little bit more. Um, but then, you know, I also on the left, like go through like how long has this been going on? What sort of the pain scale is it? Do you remember any sort of injury? It's always good to note, like, is it getting worse, better or the same? It gives me an idea of uh, where are we on the barometer of, 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 you know, where, what direction is this going on? And also, is it stopping them from doing anything? Um, what makes it better? Um, have you done physical therapy for this? And the other key thing for me is if they are doing physical therapy for this, what are they doing in physical therapy? If they tell me that they're doing physical therapy, but maybe they're doing some massage or, you know, they're doing some stretching, but they're not really getting into like the core of things. Um, then we sort of talk about a little bit more of what I'd like to see happening um, more with core strengthening and, and things like that. And then I go into more of what Ian was talking about, like what kind of sports are you playing? Are, are they doing these, you know, one sport things that are a little bit more at risk for spondylolisthesis or spondylolysis um, and things like that, or, or putting them more at risk for back pain? Um, physical exam, we sort of uh, test nerves, abdominal reflex, gait, we were looking for any sort of gait differences back extension, straight leg raise, looking at hamstring tightness, um, you know, doing good skin exam, palpation of the back, looking for scoliosis or kyphosis, um, looking at I, things that I ask about, um, because again, most likely there are things that are happening in their environment. Backpacks, you know, post COVID, I talk a lot about um, their virtual learning. Where are you studying? Are you studying in your bed or are you studying at a desk? If you're studying at a desk, like what sort of, is it at the dining room table where it's not appropriately, um, you know, the height is not good. Are you at the couch? Um, are, do you have a book stand? Um, you know, things like that. I, I ask a lot of questions about how they're learning to get an idea of whether it's, it's, uh, if it did start this year during a lot of the virtual learning, is that what's contributing to uh, their back pain or are they just less active or are they more active, you know, things like that. Um, if it was pre-COVID um, and it's gotten better, then maybe it has, uh, you know, is related to their, back, uh, their backpacks. Um, do they do a lot of gaming, um, some psychosocial difficulties, their cell phone? Um, how many sports are they playing? Are they playing just one sport, but a lot of it? Um, and also one thing that I think that people have a hard time bringing up, um, we actually were talking about it a couple of weeks ago, is weight. You know, uh, obesity is a big issue in America, and I think sometimes it's really hard to talk about it. I think every uh, physician, um, we were also talking about this, that in our practice, every physician has a different way of approaching it with uh, our, our patients. Um, but I think it's important to broach the subject. I think it can contribute to back pain. And we're supposed to be treating the patient holistically and not just um, looking for something mechanical. We're supposed to be looking at all these contributing factors and, and weight can be a contributing factor. So uh, we shouldn't just um, dismiss it because it's hard to talk about. Uh, so treatment, lightening the load. Some of the things that I talk about um, and, and within my own experience with teenage kids is, you know, a lot of it's not books these days, it's binders and they have, they keep all their papers in it. Why do you need all those papers? You don't need to bring all those papers to school every single day. Like you can take, um, like the section out of the binder and, and put it in accordion folder at home. And then when they're done with the section, then they, they can move it to a different folder at home, but they don't need to take all the papers to school every single day. So you need to go through like your teen's backpack. First of all, weigh it, weigh the teen and make sure that it doesn't weigh like more than 10% of their body weight. And strategize ways to decrease the weight. There, there's so many things in their backpack they do not need every day. So it's just about um, recognizing what they need and what they don't need. 
gaming, screen time limits, ergonomic chair, like there's, it doesn't mean they can't game. It's just working away, working around ways to be able to do it. So it's not um, increasing uh, back pain. Um, psychosocial difficulties, if you think, if the patient, uh, parent thinks that that could be contributing to it, maybe a, a, a therapist, if they've, they've got a lot of anxiety or things like that. Cell phones, you know, they should just be aware of their posture. You know, these kids are on their phones and they're like, you know, totally uh, bent over the phone. Um, you know, just be more aware of their posture, how they study, you know, don't study in, in the bed, um, you know, try to study at a desk with a book stand. Um, how many sports, like Ian was talking about, do multi-sport sports, listen to your body, don't push it. Um, if they are doing sports, I know that I've found with my kids when they're doing sports at school, they're not warming up, they don't stretch, they don't do core, none of those things. So really talking with your patients about coming up with a plan with their physical therapist about um, the warm-up and core routine that they should be doing before their practice. Uh, and again, wait, if it is really a problem, then maybe talking to a nutritionist, um, having their pediatrician work with them on um, referring them to the appropriate uh, team. Um, treatment, um, you know, uh, there's different things out there. Uh, obviously over the counter is, is what I would recommend. Ibuprofen, Tylenol for some of our post-op patients. Um, the lidocaine patches have been helpful. So if it's really bad, like maybe some over-the-counter lidocaine patches. Um, ice, heat, <clears throat> I'm not a fan of the plug-in uh, heating pads because I've, I've seen kids get burned. So I prefer the, you know, like the neck wraps that you can put in the microwave or the uh, freezer, the ones that you can plug in, like the water ones that you plug in, heat up, and then you unplug and use those. Uh, the chronic pain relief is core strengthening. You can either do it formally with physical therapy, but again, tell your patients, like put up, it's all about expectations, especially with teenagers. This you need to do for at least three months to see a difference. So do it for three months. Or if they want to start out informally, like sometimes I'll tell the patients, like start off with some Pilates, yoga, trainer. If those don't work, then call me back and we'll do formal physical therapy if, if you want to do that. Um, but again, you have to like put in the effort and put in the time. Um, often people ask about chiropractor. It, it's fine, but again, it's often more temporary and I find that physical therapy is more long lasting because they're working on the core. Um, acupuncture, um, I've also found um, to be a nice adjunct to the core uh, strengthening. Um, another uh, thing is just when to refer. Red flags, abnormal exam findings, abnormal diagnostic findings, refractory treatment, and younger child. Thank you um, for your time. Thanks, Amber. It's a great overview on uh, back pain in kids. And now I'll introduce my uh, friend, colleague, uh, buddy for a long time, and one, truly one of the best <laughs> pediatric spine care practitioners in the world, David Skaggs, who's joining us from LA, who's going to get a little bit more granular about uh, your personal algorithm for managing, evaluating uh, back pain. So thanks very much, David. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Amber. Could everybody see my screen and hear me? Perfect. Awesome. Okay, so this is going to be very practical. You know, what do you do when someone walks into your office? What are the questions to ask? How do you know when to ramp things up? And it would be really nice if this changed. <laughs> so as many people have talked about, back pain is common. And most of the time in kids, you're not going to find an identifiable diagnosis. And this makes it tough. Because in the rare or less common cases in which something is wrong, it's your job to find it. So I'm going to hopefully try to help you find it with this algorithm. So we're going to start off with history and physical and say what findings on history of physical are going to tell you to get imaging and then when to elevate imaging. So history, as Amber pointed out, is it getting better? It's getting better. Get out of my office. You don't need a doctor. Is it getting worse or is it the same? But be careful. Is it getting better because of rest? You know, if every time someone goes back to sports, it hurts more, you know, that doesn't really mean they're getting better. So the red flags is if it's getting progressively worse over time and it's not intermittent, it just keeps getting worse. That's when you worry. That's when you think about, you know, MRI and imaging. Now, the next thing is night pain is an entirely different world. We have to define night pain very clearly here. If you have back pain that wakes you up in the middle of the night from a deep sleep, 
we need an MRI of your spine. That's no questions asked. Frequently, that's a tumor or infection until proven otherwise. And you know, how long has the pain been going on? If it's hurt for two years, your tendency is to kind of write it off and go, eh, it's chronic back pain. But the truth is that sometimes people have a real treatable problem, like a spondylolysis, that has just been there for two years and has been undiagnosed. So if it hurts for a long time, don't overlook it. It could still be real. And one of the biggest red flags in young children is they're not doing a favorite activity. So two weeks ago, a four-year-old came into my office, looked pretty normal on exam, hamstrings weren't tight, moved around normally, punched on his back, didn't hurt too much. But the one thing that stuck out is his mom said, you know what? He loves riding horses and he says his back hurts too much to ride horses. Based on that alone, I admitted him to the hospital, kid had leukemia. So anytime a real young kid just isn't doing normal activities, take that seriously. And you ask about neurological symptoms. And I tell kids, okay, this is gonna sound kind of funny. I'm gonna ask you silly questions, but do you pee in your pants a lot? You know, do you have pain that goes down into your buttocks or your legs? If the answer to either one of these questions is yes, we have to take that seriously, that's probably an indication for an MRI. And uh, on the intake form, you may want to consider having kids or families draw where their pain hurts. You know, if it hurts in their back or their buttocks or the leg, that's spinal. If the pain hurts outside the body, you're not going to cure that pain with orthopedics. You want to know that ahead of time. Okay, physical exam. Let's just talk about some, uh, some very practical pearls here, if we could. So if pain hurts like all over, welcome to adulthood. You know, yeah, your back hurts all over, don't worry much. But if it hurts in one particular place, this is a finger test. And the positive finger test, take that seriously. You people may recognize this model. She may have rotated in your service lately. And, and remember, uh, oftentimes, back pain may be referred from someone else. I'd say in the last six months, I've seen a kid with back pain who really had a kidney infection, menstrual pain, you know, comes and goes with uh, menstruation, ovarian cysts or gallbladder. So be a little bit aware that it might not be the back, it might be referred pain. So look at this kid. You see two abnormalities. One is a loss of lumbar lordosis. Two, his knees are flexed, tight hamstrings. So this is a Phelan Dixon posture, and this particular kid had discitis. Um, so you can maybe see here, you see how this disc right here, let me see if I'm cool enough to know how to do this. This disc is a little bit smaller than the discs above it. The disc should get bigger on the way down. So have a kid bend forwards. If it hurts, welcome to adulthood. It kind of hurts us all when you bend forwards. But if it really hurts, when they bend backwards in one particular place, they're telling you, I have a spondium till proven otherwise. It might be a spondylolysis with a little break in the pars intraarticularis. It might be a spondylolisthesis, where usually L5 is slipped forward in S1, or it could be a facet fracture. I tend to see a lot of these in elite uh, athletes, and it's a pretty small surgery to take that out. Facet fractures are missed on MRIs most of the time. So if it hurts bending backwards, the algorithm is to consider a CT scan because both spondylolysis and facet fractures are frequently missed on MRI. Remember, MRIs are better at soft tissue, CTs are better at bone. Now beware, CTs have radiation. You don't wanna radiate everybody, but if it's a very specific pain, you may want to consider a CT just over a couple vertebrae. So if you ask someone to bend forwards and they just bend forward straight fine, but if they really go off to the side every time they bend forwards, this could be a, spine, a spinal cord tumor, consider getting an MRI. And thoracolumbar spine trauma. Now, you know, you generally don't see this in the office, but I'm surprised how many kids you see a week or two out and they have tenderness directly over the spine. That is a spine fracture until proven otherwise. I have a series of seven kids with chance fractures, meaning the posterior elements ripped open and they weren't picked up even after seeing spine surgeons. So if someone has tenderness directly over their spine, 
take that seriously, start getting imaging studies. So now you have to be careful though, because some kids don't want to go to chip class and you can do a fake out study. You can push on their head and go, oh, if that causes back pain, that gives you a clue that maybe this kid has some secondary gain and doesn't want to go to chip class. Okay, so let's talk about a real life 60 second neuro exam. Hop up and down in one foot three times. You've tested all kinds of balance and strength. Walk on your heels. This tests the anterior tip. If you can't walk on your heels, something's wrong. Let's see if we can actually do this test. This is the umbilicus test. You see you stroke on one side, the belly button moves. You stroke on the other side, the belly button didn't move. That means it's an asymmetric umbilicus reflex test. Get an MRI. If there's ever asymmetric test, get an MRI. If there's just decreased you know, reflexes, generally that doesn't mean too much. Look for ankle clonus, tone and motion. If you try to push the foot past neutral dorsiflexion, you get some clonus, be worried about it. Consider neurological workup. You know, sensation, we've all learned this, just lightly stroke over the medial knee, medial ankle, big toe, lateral foot. If anything feels different from the right and left side, that's a red flag. Consider neuro workup, get an MRI. And I consider the popliteal angle to be the ESR of the neurological spine exam. So if anything's wrong neurological, this seems to be this final common pathway of having tight hamstrings, discitis, spondylolysis, spinal cord tumor. You know, if you hit about a 50, 60 degree angle, that's fine. If you get a 90 degree angle, that's pathologic, consider further workup. Now a straight leg raise, if you raise the leg and it causes pain in the back of the leg underneath the knee, you know, that is a kind of herniated disc or something bothering a nerve rate, nerve root until proven otherwise. This is more of an adult test. I would say in the pediatric population, you really want to look at the pediat at the uh, popliteal angle more. But if you do have a positive straight leg raise, consider it a disc or something bothering a nerve root until proven otherwise. Now, a lot of people talk about SI joint pain. I have to admit, I don't see that too frequently in kids. You may consider doing the Faber test, but more sensitive is simply pushing on the SI joint. If you push on the SI joint and it hurts, consider an MRI and look for uh, inflammation around the SI joint. And remember, no spine exam is complete until you've examined the feet. If there is cavus feet or claw toes, you have to consider the possibility of a tumor or a neurological condition until proven otherwise. So in general, the imaging protocol is, you know, I get an EOS image, PA and lateral of the spine, just if the parents want it. And in some ways it's kind of free. It might cost money, but there's almost no radiation if the dials are turned correctly. It's really less radiation than flying from Los Angeles to New York. So if parents want an X-ray and I have an EOS image, I get it. Now with regular x-rays, there is a little bit of radiation. I try to talk parents out of it, you know, unless the pain is really consistent or getting worse over the period of two weeks. If there's any abnormal history or physical, which we just talked about, get an MRI. Don't hesitate, no radiation. Consider a CT if there's localized pain with extension, think that there's a posterior element fracture until proven otherwise. And while people used to talk a lot in the past about spec bone scans, I really think there are very little places for spec bone scans now because it's lots of radiation. The only time I would do that is if x-rays, MRI, and CT is negative, you've tried physical therapy, and there's unremitting pain and the parents are pushing you, you may want to consider a spec bone scan, uh, but it's pretty rare that that's showing something that the other studies don't show. And remember, if an MRI is negative, like this kid on the left, it's a 15 year old who had a MRI showing a bulging disc. She had three injections, which did nothing but caused her more pain. Consider a CT. This kid actually had a end plate fracture. Remember, this is a growth plate fracture. There's a piece of bone sticking into her nerve root. She was in all kinds of pain and the MRI missed it. So if the MRI is negative, but you think something's going on, consider a CT. So at some point you will face this pathway. 
Are you going to recommend strengthening, flexibility, aerobic conditioning, and maybe meditation three times a week for the next 60 years? Do you think it's just normal muscular back pain? Or do you think that it's something that you have to investigate further with this algorithm of when to get x-rays, MRIs, and CTs? So thank you. I welcome any questions during the discussion. All right, that that's uh, that's awesome. Thanks, Dave. That was uh, um, I, I loved uh, hearing you talk. A lot of a little bit of overlap with some of the things that I had said. Um, one of the the things that I found you know most interesting about your talk and um, it was sort of how aggressive hey, you are. Yeah. Ben, so I think we have one more talk. We have Kelly uh, to speak about ergonomics, and then we'll get into Q and A. That's Kelly, I'm so sorry. I can't wait to hear your pearls. Bye. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right, I will share my screen. Can everyone hear me okay and see the screen? Okay, perfect, okay. great. All right, hi everyone, I am Kelly Grimes. I am a physical therapist. I have the pleasure of working with this team at Columbia in New York Presbyterian. I work with individuals with spine structural changes across the lifespan. And today I'm excited to chat about principles of ergonomics for our adolescent population and particularly focused around school and studying. Um, as others have mentioned, this topic came onto our radar, radar more particularly in the last year with the COVID pandemic when the routines and schedules of our youth population came to an abrupt halt and in all cases, home environments quickly needed to pivot to virtual learning spaces. Anecdotally, we started seeing a rise in complaints of musculoskeletal back pain in our offices, and it prompted us to be a bit more robust in our education on, in this area. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest relevant to this presentation. These are the key concepts I'll go over in the next few minutes, and I'll go over them one by one. First up, the basics of ergonomics for school studying and even gaming. For most of us adults, we have either spent time in school or we spend some portion of our work days at desks or computers. This, a lot of this may be familiar to us, but let's go through these concepts and problem solve situations pertinent to the teenage population. First, picture the side profile of your teenager and visualize creating three 90 degree angles, one at the elbow, one at the hip, and one at the knees. What this does is it creates sort of like a basic skeleton to help set up the teen for success. It does not mean that the adolescent needs to be in this position all, all, all the time. But if this is the starting option, what it does is it allows the joints, muscles, and connective tissues to work at what we call mid-range, meaning the body is not being asked to function at any one extreme position for prolonged periods of time. For example, with this setup, the wrists are able to be in a mid-range position, neither too extended, which may occur if the individual is too tall for the workspace, space, nor too flexed, which may occur if the individual is too short for the desk. Second, ensure that the feet are supported on something, either the floor or a foot rest, which can be purchased or constructed from something at home, like a box or a stack of books. Use a chair that has a backrest. Position the body at arm's length away from the monitor and encourage your teen to sit square in the chair. The barrier you may not be able to navigate around is if your teen has literally grown too big for the desk chair, your environment. I'm pausing for the laughter that I know is occurring. Otherwise, you may find that you can create a school or study station using items in your home. Keep in mind that as your teen is going through their life's biggest growth spurt, their body proportions will change and we have to set up their study environment to allow room for this change to take place. If you have an adult sized surface in your home for school or studying, such as a desk, a kitchen or a dining table, potentially a chair with an adjustable height may be beneficial. And these can run the gamut in terms of price, but reasonably affordable chairs do exist. Another factor to troubleshoot is the length of your teen's thigh bones in relation to the depth of the chair. If your teen is too small for the depth of the chair, you may add a firm pillow at the backrest to scoot them forward and then use a footrest for the floor. Conversely, if their thigh bones are too long for the depth of the chair, then you may need to look into a chair with an increased depth size or adjustable depth size. 
Next, as cute as this visual is, ensure that the monitor is at eye height. The topic of armrests on the chair is a bit individualized based on the particular setup in your environment. For example, in this figure shown where the model is using a desk with um, a keyboard tray underneath, armrests may be helpful to support the weight of her arms, as in this figure, only her fingertips are contacting the keyboard. However, in the image in the previous slide where the keyboard was resting on the surface of the desk, the team may run into the issue of the armrests literally running into the desk itself, preventing the team from getting close enough to be productive. Again, it's an issue to problem solve on a case-by-case -case basis. Other factors, if your team exclusively uses a laptop, you may want to consider a laptop stand, which they sell, or simply to stack the laptop onto a box or a stack of books to obtain that, um, that monitor at eye height level, and then obtain an external keyboard and mouse, which would simulate the setup of a desktop computer and the option of those 90 degree angles described previously, while still allowing for the portability of the laptop. Ensure the lighting in the room is similar to the, to the lighting of the computer screen, um, which is tough for night owls or folks who are sharing spaces, who are doing work while others are sleeping. These folks may find themselves in dark rooms, uh, staring at the light of the monitor, and this can be stressful um, on the eyes. It's best if the um, if this screen is free of glare. So for example, from the light coming in from an open window, um, and this is an important one. Look away from the screen, this is for all of us, not just adolescents, look away from the screen every 15 minutes to reduce eye strain and give the eyes something else to focus on. Lastly, noise canceling headphones, I'm wearing them, may be helpful to minimize distraction during virtual learning um, or studying and schoolwork in common spaces. Now that we've covered some of the basics of ergonomics, keep in mind that we were never designed to be relegated to one position all day. I think Ian touched on this nicely with his tangible advice to encourage postural aware, both postural awareness and then postural changes regularly throughout the day. So it's not, again, it's not that sitting in and of itself is so, so bad for our teens, but it's the lack of physical activity and sedentary lifestyle, particularly in the non-athletes that can be problematic. Therefore, if we can focus not necessarily on demonizing sitting or any one still position, but prioritizing how we as support people for our teens can organize the week so that they fulfill the recommended physical activity guidelines, we'll be doing them a great service. The current physical activity recommendations for school-aged children, including this wide range of ages from six to 17 years, is at least 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous activity, with vigorous activity, muscle strengthening, and bone strengthening to take place on three or more days per week. Let's dive into this a little bit more. Here's a general breakdown of what is meant by moderate versus vigorous intensity activity. A quick way to tell whether or not your teen is engaging in a moderate versus vigorous intensity activity is to administer a talk test. So essentially, if the teen is able to talk but not sing, they're performing at a moderately intense level. If your teen is not able to say more than a few words at a time without pausing for a breath, they're engaged in a vigorously intense task. Aside from ensuring that the teen is engaging in vigorously intense activity, you also want to ensure that they're engaging in some sort of muscle and bone strengthening. The type of muscle strengthening or resistance training that your teen may engage with is quite variable and depends on their maturity level, goals for what they're looking to engage with. We do know through research that there are numerous benefits to resistance training even beyond the obvious changes to muscle properties. Resistance training contributes to improved maturity of the central nervous system, which essentially is the connection of the brain to the rest of the body through the nerves, which leads to a better, um, better coordination and better movement patterns through life. Resistance training also contributes to increased bone quality, which I'll talk about in a second, and tendon resilience. In the past, there was this belief that strength training using external load was detrimental to the youth due to the potential damage of high forces across immature growth plates. However, more recent evidence has disproved this myth given quality supervised training and further investigation of the old studies that contributed to this belief demonstrated that injuries were often due to errors in safety, form, and technique. Therefore, proper supervision and training is highly recommended when starting to engage in resistance training involving external load, such as free weights. 
Along with vigorous activity and muscle strengthening, it's recommended that teens engage in activity several times per week that promote bone strength. And this is for our non-athletes, our, our athletes, particularly our kids with scoliosis. We know that 50% of bone mass in adults is accumulated in our youth and optimizing bone health during this time of life has effects on bone strength and quality throughout adulthood. Childhood and adolescence is this unique time of life where bone mass is on the upswing, peaking somewhere in our 20s, and then sadly leveling off and declining thereafter. Participation in weight-bearing activities such as walking or running, along with team sports such as soccer, baseball, basketball, you name it, help to increase bone mass. And there are caveats to this. Ian was touching on, on a few of them. High-level gymnasts that practice 20 to 25 hours a week long distance cross country and track athletes, where you may be dealing with the other end of the spectrum in terms of excessive exercise um, that actually then has a negative impact on bone mass. But for our um, non-athletic teenage population, we really want to be encouraging, um, encouraging optimization of this time in life to increase bone mass. And finally, we've discussed this this evening, we hear a lot of this languaging out there on good and bad posture. And the reality is, is that there's no one ideal posture. What we've presented, what I've presented earlier are parameters, a light structure to help set the teen up for success. The reality is the more movement, the more variability, the less sedentary, the better. We think the key questions to ask about posture and alignment are, does your teen live in one particular posture and cannot get out of it? So this would be, for example, uh, a kid who sits slouched. And then when you tell them to grow tall and perhaps widen their shoulders a bit, they literally can't, or if they can, it's such a great effort to hold the position. Or does your teen assume a particular posture like 98% of the time and they don't change it up ever? So the goal isn't one perfect position that the, that the teen holds perfectly all day long, but that they're able to move in and out of a variety of positions. These are my references and thank you so much for having me as always. I'm going to stop sharing. Awesome, thanks Kelly. And then Prachi, I'll finish us up in the last few minutes here. Great, I, there's actually a question um, that I think hopefully Dr. Skag can help us with. What are your thoughts on um, post-op therapy, uh, specifically for someone who's had scoliosis? Do you refer to a scoliosis-specific PT? How quickly do you start? Um, and then what are your goals for the patient? So let's be clear, if we're talking about a patient who had a posterior spinal fusion, uh, they see a therapist immediately post-op day one, two, three, get them up, moving around. And after that, it's up to the parents. You know, in general, most of the kids, I think, just get themselves back to normal activities. And sometimes people want a little bit of extra help and sometimes they don't. And if, especially if someone's really a motivated athlete, I think they're going to get out there and do it. And sometimes kids need a little bit of extra help and motivation. And it's uh, much better to have a professional physical therapist do that rather than a parent who will fight with their teenagers. Now, does it need to be scoliosis specific? I am not sure about that. And I'm open to the advice of other faculty members on that. When I see patients at 10 days, I find that the really sedentary kids um, get back to their baseline more quickly with some um, you know, we have a post-op protocol, so I send them, I encourage them a little bit more uh, to do our post-op protocol with our physical therapist. They can do it virtually or in person or with someone locally. Uh, and then our highly motivated um, athletic kids also get back to their sports more quickly when they also do a regimen with um, the post-op protocol. So those are two sort of sets of kids that I'm a little bit more recommending when I see them initially. And then the rest, I leave it up to them. I'll never say no to it because I right. see them initially and I'm the one like talking with them the first six weeks. So I, I'll never say no, but those are the two subsets of kids that I'm a little bit more uh, recommending it. I like that. If anyone wants therapy, the answer is always yes. Yeah. Never say no to that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, just just with regards to your um, you know comment about do you need scoliosis specific therapy? I think I think the short answer is no. You don't need it certainly, um, but certainly in a couple of settings it's super helpful. I think if the kid had trough therapy before surgery, then it's going to be helpful to go to someone who knows them and things like that. If their concerns are related to alignment, things like that, like their shoulders are off or their waist is still off after selective thoracic fusion, trough can be much more helpful for that. And in general, all things being equal, if, if, uh, if they have access to a Schroth therapist, nobody understands that. And I think even if it's not a specific issue, there's an athlete looking to get back, I think they'll do really well in that setting. Yeah, yeah just to piggyback on that, I, you know, in the pre-COVID world, I know, and even still, I know geography is a big factor. So if there is not a scoliosis specific therapist in your area, you know, what, what are you to do? I think in post COVID with virtual, um, with, for virtual telehealth therapy, those barriers have been removed a little bit, but in terms of like, does the, does the child need scoliosis specific physical therapy? Obviously I'm biased. I am a physical therapist with scoliosis training, but I just, I do feel like that before I received my scoliosis education, I had like one hour of scoliosis education in school. And so I can definitely say that my comfort level in 2012 dealing with a kid with a long fusion post-surgery is far different than my comfort level now having gone through all the education I have. And I would say most of us that have really are super passionate about it and by now have hundreds of hours of scoliosis education. So I wouldn't say it's like Schroth or any specific approach, but it's just the level of education post-professionally that, that therapists with scoliosis specific education have done that's that would be the advantage in sending a kid post-operatively. Great point. Yeah, I agree. I think that our, our, our scoliosis specific therapists are more comfortable pushing patients. They don't say, oh, no bending, twisting, or turning like you hear sometimes. They understand what the issues are with uh, shoulder asymmetry that they can work on or, or, or things like that. So, um, yeah, we use it. I don't know. Ben, what would you say your number is 20% of post-op patients get 25%? Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, 20% is probably about right with about half of those being, you know, just related to, you know, waist asymmetries or things like that. And the other half being increased activity. David, what's your number in the East, on the West Coast? Probably 10 to 20% as well. And I have to admit, you guys have fully convinced me that given the choice, yeah, you want to see someone that's scoliosis, scoliosis specific, because otherwise most physical therapists are seeing old farts like me after total hip or knee replacements. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I agree. Like you get so many, like we'll get a lot of calls from therapists like, oh, they can't bend, they can't do this. Right. And they think there's restrictions. So yeah. I definitely um, echo everybody <clears throat> that I think Schroth is never a bad idea and almost all the families are open to it. So, yeah. hey, well, uh, I'd make it, go ahead. Please go ahead, Dave. Go ahead, Dave. I, I want to make a comment. Kelly, I love what you said about movement is good and being in one specific posture is bad. Because I can't tell you how many kids are like, doctor, when they make me sit up straight in school, it hurts my back. I hate it. Like, what about when you slouch? Oh, then I feel good. Yeah. So it's different for different kids. And I think it's really all about movement. I love hearing you say that. Yeah, no, I think that that's been pushed on us in our training and it's, it's reality. I like, if you think of us as an adult, as adults, none of us sit in that 90, Ow. 90, 90 degree all day long, we're, sh we're changing positions. Right. Um, so I think, yeah, to, to push this sit up straight all the time is totally unrealistic. Yep. Thank well, you. Great. It is 8.31. We are at the end of our couple hours together. Appreciate everyone's time uh, joining us. I especially appreciate our amazing faculty and our guest faculty, uh, again, from the West Coast, uh, Dr. David Skaggs. Thanks so much. Great seeing you, buddy. And always learned so much from you. You've taught us so, uh, so much about great spine care. And Ian, loved your talk. And uh, already emailed the Jack Flynn that uh, there's great jobs available in New York City if you're uh, interested. In this. So, <laughs> and to the rest of the faculty, thank you very much. Uh, amazing uh, time together. Really appreciate it. Have a great night, everyone, until we're all together again. Looking forward to it.